Those people have evil spirits. You, you have stupid spirits. This place is Arroyo, my cutting-edge tribal village where I was born, kicked away and brought back because at the end of the day, nobody can speak Brahmin better than me. That's why everybody here calls me smart. They have no choice because I am a son of the village elder. She says I'm very much like my granddad, whose name was Yep, it's me. Neither my grandma nor my mom knew him personally, but rumors have it, he was extremely bright. I mean due to the radiation sickness. His intelligence was so over his head, he used to copy two girls one cup daily back in his vault. Then after he was exiled, he set the world on fire, impregnated my grandma by a cam rain thousands kilometers away from her, and then mutated into a green goo, and finally only this suit was left from him. And then there was me. My mom describes me as an exceptionally… Tough road to hoe. That's how she described me in a few words after she had read out loud 172 synonyms and 16 expressions related to the word dumb. She says she taught me that because I am going on my journey of my life and those are the only words I will ever hear. Sure thing, I love my mom, she knows what's best, she taught me how to fight and where not to stick my meat. My mom says the journey I am going on must happen because even though my village Arroyo is the best, the spirits she spoke to said we have two problems problems, droughts and me. So by general consent of spirits, tribals, dogs, insects and dirt around, I was chosen to go and save the day by finding the gek. What is it you would ask? I have no idea. They tried to explain to me this device is used for harnessing the post-nuclear wasteland. But the problem is I grasp only two words all the time. The hack and harassing. Anyway, today is my first day of trials and I must go and complete challenges in the cave which is called the Temple of Trials. The shaman of my village promises me something special when I am back. They say I should not worry. All the way till the end those trials are like pranks. My villagers will dress up as red scorpions to play with me. At the same time shooting poisonous needles. Why do they call it trials anyway? I had no idea nor could I understand what that brilliant guy was saying while begging for the ambulance, coughing his lungs out so realistically. His acting felt so real, I don't get it why he wasn't a famous actor back then. As a prize I got that trophy vault suit of my granddad. It fit me like a glove and smelled like my granddad in his 60s, although he died in his 30s. Additionally I got his hand TV boy, which could show me moving pictures. I couldn't stop barking so happy. I was. I ran back to the village to tell good news. When they saw me, they immediately stopped partying and put away all the decorations. They always did like that when I was away. I think it was their way to summon me back. Then the shaman could heal me with a healing decoction. He'd promised me as a surprise. I drank everything until the last drop. It tasted disgusting, but as long as it worked, I was okay with it. Here is the recipe if you need it. Warm wood, radioactive water, shaman seed and red scorpion's venom. Here you go. Take it three times a week and you will never have pain or vision again. It depends. One day I went to say hi to my mom and she told me a story about the vault my granddad was born in, the legendary vault 13. That hack had to be there. My mission was to find it. The guy called Vic and the city Klamath were supposed to help me on my way. She kissed me last goodbye and whispered that I could take money from my aunt's wallet, because she was an aunt after all and nobody liked her anyway. I did as she said and took off as a bullet to Klamath. That place looked like a hellhole. Who in their right mind would come up with those ugly brick structures and those cheerful monstrosities. Can you see that? Yikes. On the notice board I saw a drawing of a Brahmin with a big axe through it. And the word Thor scrolled underneath. Among dozens of scribbles that was the only note that made sense. By his disoriented look and non-stop drooling I realized I finally met a like-minded genius. Our dialogue led us to the discussion of current trends in science. We covered the brutal nature of the unconventional works of Damien Hirst and of spirits we pray to. We came to the conclusion that even though they are just made up means to manipulate us. They are our race of hope at the darkest night. In the end he asked me for help with bugmen that take mumus at midnight. Sure thing, brother. Thor thanked me for help and shed a tear. Perhaps it was because we share one similarity. Our IQs together equal the number on my suit. 
I went back to the city and saw a bathhouse. Surely after a long fight I had to take a shower. Inside I saw some playful women, whose sparks were vanishing with my every step. The closer I came, the less visible they tried to be. When I spoke to them, 9 times out of 10 they just spat in my face. Even though those townies had a strange way of taking a shower, I said thanks and looked in the mirror. Since I washed off the dirt and blood I had been wearing since my birth, I realized that I didn't have a potato as a distant family member that my people used to talk about, and my skin was as normal as the next guys. Roaming the city I saw a shack with the name Vix on it. That was the guy my mom talked about, yet how could a building help me? Anyway, I stepped inside. There I found a walkie-talkie. Toki, talk to me! Strangely, I did not respond. Or maybe it was a magical amulet that brought good luck? Time will tell. My mom was right as always. Vic was really helpful. He gave me a boomstick and hard pills to swallow cold bullets. Then I met Sulik, my brother from another mother. He explained the basics of this world, saying that most people around there had evil spirits, whereas I had stupid spirits. It means I'm a goodie. I need to keep it in my mind not to lose my head. He agreed to travel with me if I paid his debt of 350 shiny coins coins to the landlady. Making shiny coins was a simple task. After I helped Thor to knock out some actors who played red scorpions, I tore apart tails from their costumes. Then I threw those 15 tails into the merchant's face. In an exchange he threw some coins back at me. It was enough to pay Sulik's debt and we went searching for the hack and his sister who was kidnapped by slavers. Later in the wasteland, while I was chasing a tumbleweed, I met three metal men and a family of three on my way. The metal men sounded threatening. They wanted some knowledge from the family. And when the family family refused to tell them what they knew, the metal man mercilessly killed all of them. I could hear my stupid spirits started booing and screaming until somebody called them and without a second thought they gave away their credit card details to a random phony shaman that summoned them. Oh, hell. Wait a second. I've seen the metal man before in my dreams. There were strange writings on the wall. And then those metal men killed innocent people stepping out from the shiny hall. I wonder what it all meant. But they left me alive and then they diagonally went right, left, right, left, right. One thing I knew for sure, those bucket hats were up to no good. In my search for Sulik's sister I found something even better. The wall city. I couldn't help but enter inside and ask what's what. The barman at the bar said this. Name's Cassidy. I run this place. Place. Knock knock! Hit on the head a little too often, eh? Sorry, I don't speak imbecile. Too bad for you, I was smarter, I knew two languages. I asked the same questions to the guards and they immediately got what's what. They saw me as the perfect servant material. Then they sent me down to the vault because I had to clear out the storerooms. I was going to do it anyway, so thanks for your hospitality. There inside the crates I found water chips. I had a feeling that thousands of people had died because it was broken. Going to the lower level, I heard a woman talking from the metal box. As a true gentle tribal man, I I had to smell and save her. I broke into the box to help her get out, but instead I saw dead snakes shooting balls of light around. I couldn't resist the temptation and grab them. I don't remember what happened later, but I woke up fresh and energized like never before. Then I saw a small boy from my pip boy. They looked alike, so maybe they were separated twins. The pip boy from the box was pointing at the empty slot next to him. Probably they wanted to talk. I inserted my little boy first. My mama would be very angry if she saw it again. And then I connected the pip boy. They were speaking about something for a few minutes, but so fast, like they were playing a spelling bee competition. W O. M. So I just couldn't keep up. But I got a few names between the lines, wall 15 and wall 13. When I finished, I fastened the pip boy back on my hand and saw the wall 15 location on my map. Also, I bet I'd seen the number 13 somewhere before. Bingo, that's how many times I trip over a day. I had a feeling I had to explore these two walls. But first I needed to get back to the surface. It turned out to be simple. Here how it was. By accident I bump into a doctor. He starts asking if my ass is tense and when I take off my pants to show it to him, he immediately kicks me away from the vault. Damn, doctors those days. Then on my way to the vault I came across New Reno, the city where I visited the second cave in my life since the trials. In the first building I met a golden robot guard with three eyes and an arm. That was one of the prettiest things I've ever seen. I was sure it knew something about what the heck I was looking for. I asked its name, but it didn't respond. I screamed that my name was Miss Mart. I demanded it to answer, but it kept silent. I threatened it that I was a descendant of the great vault dweller, but it didn't give in. Lastly, I decided to shake hands to make peace, but it screamed.
I got scared out of my wits and then I realized they surrounded me, so I slowly shambled off. However, the golden robots were constantly pointing up. Maybe there was their god. I needed to see it myself. I went upstairs and met not a god, but a goddess instead. She was looking down upon me as the goddess must. She was wearing gold gecko skin which highlighted her divine status. And also I couldn't stop staring at her outstanding meaty jugs. At first it seemed she got angry, but then she told me I was strong. But no. Miss Mark. She invited me to her chamber to show something. And without Sulik, because he had his grumpy bone, he couldn't stop polishing. The goddess explained to me the rules for the next trial because I had a key. So guys, listen to this. We are lying on the bed and then she asks me to place my hands on her waist and gently go up to her shoulders. Long story short, it led me to her cave. I mean, okay, I'd stuck my Miss Mole to different weird places, that's why the Red Scorpion King still can't look directly into my eyes. But that time with her, it felt as heavenly as it could be. I was so happy I was ready to join my spirits up there. However, my stupid spirits immediately pretended that they didn't know me and closed the other world doors. So I just fell asleep. I woke up by the battle cry of the golden robots down below. I pissed them off for sure. I needed to escape this place if I wanted to survive. Sulik was down there on the first floor, beating his bone. Hence, I needed to save myself alone. I needed weapons, gold and everything that wasn't glued to the walls. While sleeping, the goddess set the password to the safe and I picked up a gun. I kissed her last goodbye and went behind the door. Her tribals were aggressive and tried to shoot me, but I was so drunk with happiness that their heads detached by themselves and no bullet could even scratch me. When I was done I went downstairs and returned to Sulik, not as a boy but as a war chief. He was greeting me on his all fours and breathing heavily. He was saying it's because he had the fridge of red scorpion jerkies, a full warehouse of guns and a rubber doll on his back, but I know that deep down he saw the true leader in front of him and bent his knees and arms. Energized with a boost of happiness, miracles started to happen to me. First I found a location of the local army, NCR. There I found an egghead who gifted me a robot dog in exchange for a few punches to his face. And then remember that weak guy my mom told me about? Well, turns out it's not a building but a real person. Can you imagine that somebody built a temple in his honor? He must have been an important man. Long story short, I found him imprisoned by slavers. My anger couldn't be described in words, only by my fists. I killed all baddies and saved my friend, so my tribe got so much bigger, because Vic was fat. I needed a carriage to travel with my tribals around, and all of a sudden my spirit smiled at me again and guided me to the local deity who could sell a metal carriage. But first I needed to pay a tribute to the god of the metal carriage to make it move. I needed the holy artifact called the fuel cell controller. I started searching for the thing. First I visited the wall city, because their technologies were scary and superior. I thought maybe they had it, but they didn't. Instead of the artifact, I met the barman again, and that time he learned imbecile and agreed to join my tribe. Robot Doggo had to stay behind as it was too weak, and I was too afraid to see it killed. The carriage part was truly difficult to find, but I had a dream the other night which showed me where I could find the tribute. Then I felt like the real war chief people would respect and look up to. With the war machine, it was easier to locate slavers who took Sulik's sister. Surprisingly, Enough when I saw her, she looked exactly like Sulik. I took her to her tribe and moved forward as a savior of this land. Along my journey, I located a deadly boring cathedral with many books and two smart people. Yikes. I don't remember a lot about the place, but I remember one guy who was so intelligent, he started to read me a lesson and my brain started to melt. I couldn't help drooling, so he melted instead. Literally. So who is the smartest now? Then I stopped by a bridge with a creepy man guarding it. He said only the chosen one could pass the bridge. Well, I was the one. But he was speaking so complicated language I started to lose connection with my brain. I was trying to reply, but the only thing I could pronounce was the alphabet. Then he asked my name and I said that it was Miss Mark. I asked his name too and his body exploded. Wow, all those smart people couldn't stand my intelligence. Who is the smartest as now? That stinky bridge keeper had a smelly purple robe. When I picked it up, I saw that it had burnt marks and powder stains from bullets, but nothing penetrated it. I put it on and it was so unreally light as well. I've gotten stronger and stronger hour by hour. Then I found a weird place called a squad. People were very secretive there and everybody was economical with words. Only one lady invited me in her tent to speak privately and explain what's what. She said that NCR needed that place because, you see, there is a Vault 15 with an ancient artifact 
artifact inside, I couldn't believe my three ears. That was the thing I was looking for. She, however, asked for help. And CR was ready to send everybody to their graves for the artifact. But I was sure, those kind people didn't want to live in their graves. These stifling coffins are so small. I know it from the coffin my tribe presented me on my 14th birthday. Nobody expected I would make it to my 15th birthday because I used to keep to raw foodism. <laughs> they also used to call me a vegetable because of it. Yeah, that was the only reason. Anyway, that lady asked me to repair the generator to make the vault their home. Another trouble was that her daughter, Chrissy, went missing and local mayor Zeke said that the daughter was probably kidnapped by slavers. But that woman couldn't believe it. Her spirits told her something strange was going on. Especially since she spoke about her daughter, somebody was following her every step. I heard enough. As a war chief, I needed to help my neighboring tribe. I went to speak with Zeke, but he was too scarred with the truth and hindered me to go away while I could. I could have killed him for that, but the first rule of a good war chief says I must kill only two types of people. Those who attack first and those who never pay for their dinner at restaurants and expect you to pay because you are good friends. They did nothing wrong and we didn't have supper yet, so I went deeper into their settlement. There in the woods I saw a shack and an evil witch outside. She reminded me of my aunt, but I hadn't robbed her yet. She started shooting after threatening me and my tribe. We had nothing left to do but to kill her and her minions. Chrissy was closed inside when I struck up a conversation. She was threatening me that if I tried to touch her, I would wear my balls as a bow tie. I didn't want to look like Sulik. When she learned that I was a goodie, she shed light on everything that was going on there. The people outside the vault, as well as she, were the squatters, who simply wanted to survive. But the people inside the vault were the Khans, bandits. They provided food and water to the squatters in exchange for under cover against NCR. They didn't care about people on the surface and got everything they needed from raids on caravans. It goes without saying nobody was going to repair the vault and baddies wouldn't let anybody in. But who cares? I took Chrissy home and spoke with Zeke. After revealing the truth, he was genuinely surprised the Khans took over the vault and asked for help. Okay, anything for my friendly tribals. After clearing out the first floor and going to the second one, a familiar feeling struck me. I sensed that loneliness my granddad used to experience fighting alone with a dozen of the Khans. But if he was lonely most times, I was with my friends and we were ready to die for each other. Right, Vic? Damn! That place sent small biting cockroaches down my spine, because I'm afraid of the dark. When it was my 11th birthday, my aunt gave me an art lesson on Kazimir Malevich and his black square and cubism. Its black colors and forms shocked me so much, I ran away screaming and crying. I mean, have you ever seen its intimidating 90 degree angles? You can cut your eyes if you look long enough. Now, every time I close my eyes, I see squares and cubes, squares and cubes. So to help myself out, I repaired the generator that provided the vault with electricity and fixed the lights. Usually, it's very simple. You may snakes of the same color kiss each other and with the magic of love anything will work out. I took the elevator down to the third level and made sure no Khan would ever see the light of day. Their boss turned out to be the toughest one, but he was no match for my tribe, so we sent them back to their degenerate spirits. Sadly, I couldn't find the hack I was looking for. However, I located the coordinates to the Vault 13. I got a chance to find the hack and my intellectual brothers there. I returned outside to touch Mother Nature's grass and tell the good people that they became even gooder. And they could unite with the NCR tribe to be the goodest. Then my tribe and I hit the road. Yeah, take that stupid road, I hate you. Why do you always make me smart trip over? Theoretically, I could have driven directly to the Vault 13, but those shalt get sidetracked by bullshit every goddamn time. Otherwise, how else would I prove to the stone hat of my granddad that I was the chosen one for 12 hours straight? At that point, I started thinking I was the best and nobody could outsmart my might was me stupid. I found the wall 13 at last. Inside there were big brown lizard men that I kept encountering on my journeys. But these were friendly. And they were living in one big tribe, like me. What's more, they could speak. Like me. It was unreal. My first thought was to shoot them. I got bloodthirsty. For a second I forgot about my rules of the good wardship. I snapped myself back to reality and started a conversation with the Guardian. Since the first words I knew, I found my peers. With them there was a nice healer who 
told me hi and started explaining the nature of those lizard men. Originally, they were Jackson's chameleons that mutated into death claws. He was telling tons of enlightening and intriguing information for at least an hour. He lost me after hi though. I wish I could ask for my blasted brain cells back, but I was unable to speak for three days. So lizard men were not attacking and let me deeper into their lair. To my big surprise, it was the cleanest vault I have ever seen. Even my room looked like something a nuclear wasteland could draw inspiration from. There I met a woman from the squad, who moved in here and started her new life all over again. Other people were safe too, of course if they weren't overly aggressive or planned to disclose the location of the vault 13. Deeper in the library I met a lizard man in a robe. My jaw dropped, because I spotted a math book behind him, I always wanted to learn how many pages it had. 172. I just didn't know the following numbers. Anyway, the lizard man's name was Goris. He called me a seasoned traveler. I was afraid he thought of me as food, but he explained that it means traveled adventurer. Yes, people in my tribe used me as a bridge once, that's true. He wanted to join my tribe and I couldn't say no to him. He was a fierce warrior for sure. The only trouble was my current war party was too big for him and I needed to leave somebody behind. Easier said than done. When I spoke to any of my tribal, the only thing I could say was <coughs> So I had two options, get one of my tribals eliminated, which was not an option, and the second one was to find the right words to send them back to their home. But I needed a healing decoction called Mentats to put my marbles in their proper place, so I decided to put it off until later. Then I found a huge metal coffin. The person next to it explained it was the smartest computer. Yeah, yeah, I'd heard it before. Nobody was smarter than me smart. The guy said the computer was malfunctioning after the Vault 13 had survived the rebellion and the tribe leader was sent to the spirits. Somebody called Good Brother of Steel and he cleaned the vault and installed this metal coffin. However, as he said, the machine had a depression and didn't want to talk to anybody as it was supposed to. As my shaman back home always used to tell, the best way to find the source of an ailment is to cut them open. Coffin? Cut them open. Depression? <laughs> Feel the steel. Nobody was ever ill in our village, so I did the same. Turned out that there was an empty slot for an artifact that resembled another one I'd borrowed back in the vault city. I placed it into the slot and the coffin started speaking with female voice. Now it could obey your commands and fix anything that was broken in the vault. It could even display ladies taking showers. After five days of watching ladies, I remembered why I was there in the first place. To look at the lady... I mean, find the hack. I started searching the back rooms with crates. I couldn't believe my eyes when I found this hack thing. It was dusty and neglected. I guess nobody needed it. I borrowed it, but didn't tell anybody. My tribe was going to die without it. I quickly sneaked out of the place without attracting too much attention, jumped into my car, accidentally hitting Sulik when backing up, and then drove as fast as I could to deliver the holy artifact. I finally accomplished my mission and my spirits would welcome me up there. When I saw my village, I noticed the smoke reaching the sky. It was my people partying again. I drove closer, but it was completely silent. I saw the elder shaman lying on the ground, he was wounded and the bridge to the village was cut down. There was no way to get there and no party. The shaman said that hunting metal birds hovered over our village and then started shooting steel peas from above. Metal men who controlled the birds got angry and jumped down on the village, houses and people and leveled everything to the ground. Those were the mean metal people I'd seen before. Yet they didn't send everybody to the spirits. Some were kidnapped to their nest in the southwest. The shaman didn't know if they took my mom, but I felt she was alive. I could smell the scent of her hookah. The shaman demanded I save our people, because otherwise I would have no village to be kicked out from and welcomed back again. Then before his last breath, he pointed southwest the second time and knocked on the spirit's door. It was all my fault. I took too much time looking at pretty ladies and most importantly, I was too stupid to think I was the war chief. I was only worthy enough to translate Brahmin and count the hairs on my cousin's hat. He had four. I wasn't a god, and the reason why that goddess spread her legs was because she was blind and half deaf, but not because I was the chosen one. Anyway, perhaps my humble tribe and stupid me would be enough to save my people. I had to find Buckethead's nest, and that time be quick and humble. I needed to ask people around. Tor was the smartest guy I knew. He explained that the metal men were enclave. They were merciless relics of the past, governed under the rule of the president. All they did was dreaming day and night of restitution 
constitution of past glory of the whole country. They recruited the most intelligent brains around. Those who didn't join lost ones. The president believed he was the only man capable of uniting all settlements. He gathered somewhat competent soldiers, gave them food, shelter, weapons, armor, and most importantly, the dream of becoming great again. It was enough to manipulate enclave soldiers in any way he wanted and follow any command. He even created a super mutant soldier, Frank Horrigan, who was constantly pumped up with medicine and drugs, which prolongated his miserable existence as a cold-hearted weapon of mass destruction. Even though Tor didn't know how to get to their base, he'd heard rumors that somebody in San Francisco had a grudge against Enclave. I kissed Tor on the lips. Weirdly enough, they were as salty as a Brahmin butt. I said goodbye and jumped into my car. I went to the Wall 13 to ask Goris to join my humble tribe. What I saw inside brought tears to my eyes. All lizard men but Goris were dead. From the computer, I watched what happened to them. Those revolting bucket hats took away most people I could be on one page with. My stupid spirits would send vomit rain in their mouths first, and then me on their hats. Goris agreed to travel with me even though my tribe was too big for him. That time he was seeking revenge for his pack, no matter what. It took me five days to get used to him. Every time I looked at him, I thought he was my end. I even robbed him in his sleep once and ran away from my tribe at night as a force of habit. But then I remembered that Sulik carries all my treasure and and I came back. One week later, I found San Francisco. According to my calculation, at that rate, if I found my people on Enclave's base, they would have already died of old age. I needed to hurry. While I was looking for Enclave's enemies, I saw a boxing ring in the center. One of the couches noticed me and invited me for a few fights. I couldn't resist the challenge and accepted the offer. I was training day and night to be the best, to fight against the famous Lopan, the best hand-to-hand -hand fighter around. Long story short, I failed miserably. At the end of the fight I was screaming like a girl so loud that Goris saw me at the bottom of the food chain. The main difference between me and Dracula is that I can become completely invisible when I fail. Then I wait a few days until the dust settles and come out to save the day again. I found a man who looked like an enclave soldier, but that one had no helmet and wasn't killing innocent people 24-7. He said that he belongs to the tribe of good brothers of steel. That was the guy who brought computer to the wall 13. If he was a friend of the poor lizard man, then he was my friend too. As I understood from their tribe's name, they were good brothers, but thieves. He said that he could help me to get to Enclave's main base if I stole secret papers on how to build and fly metal birds from Enclave's base in Navarro. I was something of a good thief myself, so I said yes without a second thought. He said Enclave had a new base in Navarro and they didn't have enough tribals and they were in constant search of new people who would join them. I needed to leave my tribe behind to look like a new tribal, wishing to be recruited. I found a carriage station near Navarro. There was a man looking like me in a purple robe. Not to cause any suspicion, I started to do a mating dance to show him I was from his tribe. He gave me a stink eye and pulled out the radio box like I'd found at Vic's temple. I knew something went wrong, but I couldn't put my finger on what exactly, so instead I forcefully put my fist down his throat. Thanks to hard training of fist combat, my fists were of steel. I made him kiss the ground at once. Since he fell on the back of ketchup he was carrying with him, I couldn't wear his robe because it was stained, so I kept wearing my own. Then I poked around and found a secret entrance to the base. There in the long chain of tunnels I met a bucket hat face to face, but he did not shoot me. It meant my disguise worked. He asked me why I was without the metal suit. I tried to explain myself that people in our tribe are born naked, but he immediately stopped me and said he has a brother like me who is very slow. He had a snail as a brother? He said he knew what I am like and sent me to the armory to suit up and take my weapon and then to report to the drill sergeant. In the armory next door I found a laser gun and a suit of the enclave farmer. When I got inside it felt empowering. Not only was I taller and could carry more things, I could stomp so loud that dead bodies wouldn't be able to sleep in their graves. I went up to the surface and saw the metal bird. I could sense the fright my people felt when they saw it attacking. I started snooping around for the secret paper. 
developers. In the warehouse nearby, I exchanged looks with techno shaman Raul. Then we exchanged a few words. He could speak with the metal birds and heal them. He was definitely hiding the papers because he didn't let me open his locker like a regular person I usually rob would do. I went to the building next door to ask about the papers there. And another techno magician told me that he always kept them in the locker next to him. Yet he asked me if I needed them for Raul because he'd already lost them three times. I answered positively and he let me take them. So my first mission was done. I had papers on my hands, but I needed a second task to finish, to speak to the drill sergeant. Welcome to Camp Navarro. So you're the replacement. Oh, lovely. They've sent me a moron. Listen closely. You will stand guard at the hangar. This is your duty post. You will go there now and stay on guard until told otherwise. Mama! I did what I was told. I was guarding the metal bird nest for a few hours and eventually got bored. I decided my mission was complete and went down to the underground tunnels where I came from. Going through the tunnels I got sleepy from my past mission. I wanted to make my mood better and when I saw a funny looking bald man in white robes, I couldn't help but chit chat. He was speaking in paragraphs. I even passed out a few times, but the thing I got from his brainwashing is that firstly, this man is mean and evil and secondly, the lizard man did he didn't usually speak human language, but thanks to this mean fella, he could customize their intellectual abilities so they could resemble me and most importantly become a deadly controllable weapon. Some patients responded to that healing with screaming and the drill sergeant commanded to make this room soundproof to prevent soldiers from losing morale. Then as an experiment they released the smartest lizard man to the wilderness. One of them got captured and was waiting for the command of extermination in the cage nearby. Lizard men were my friends so I wanted to speak to him. His name was Zarn. Sitting in the cage was no fun. He wanted to be free and see his people again. I couldn't say no. I went back to the doctor and saw another robot doggy following me with its eyes. Asking questions, I learned that he made tests on the dog and made it a weapon with intellect and a moral compass. He called it K9. K9 didn't like the mean fella from the get-go and was barking all the time, like me. That's why we found a common language pretty fast. Then he disabled the dog, making it a living statue. That was the last straw. I took my new laser gun and made some tests with it on the mini. <laughs> Nobody could hear his screams. With parts I borrowed from Raul, I fixed the dog and it agreed to treat me as a new master. Then I freed Zarn by opening the back door and together we escaped the base. K9 showed its best in the battle and it was something else. Its bites tore apart even the strongest gecko's hides and it could dodge the attacks. I've never seen anything like that before. However, K9 couldn't carry anything. I came back to San Francisco, took Sulik, Vic, K9 and the barman from the Wall City along with me. I wanted to keep Goris and K9 alive for as long as I could. Vic's strategical boldness was a mighty weapon. It would make enemies laugh and I could use a chance to silence them forever. The good brother of steel took the papers and smiled wide open. I never knew people could have up to eight teeth. He said I saved all people from the tyranny of enclave. He prepared a big metal fish for me to go to the main enclave's base. We took the big fish and swam across the water desert. Bad luck comes in threes, they say, right? No, it comes in one, two, four, three, five, twelve. We landed on the metal island in the middle of nowhere. And nobody was welcoming us. For a second I started thinking they decided to get rid of me leaving my tribe here all alone on this island. But then we entered the main hall and saw the engraving on the floor. It read... Um... Evilness. That's where the evil spirits were hiding. Those metal boomsticks look threatening, like they could bite my ass in the future. So I decided to eliminate them now. I kept in mind my journey to the metal bird's nest and how I needed to blend in. I found similar metal suits and gave them to everybody. Then I kept following the scent of my mom's hookah and went downstairs. And Clave was speed running the fastest and most painful way to send people to the spirits. Luckily, my mom and some of my tribals from Arroyo weren't among the dead. Later in the cages behind an invisible burning wall, I saw my mom. I couldn't express my happiness properly and I started barking like a dog. That's why she calmed me down and reminded me of my final trial. The goal was simple. I had to go downstairs, smash the heart of that base and smash as many bucket heads as I could. My regular Tuesday, which would usually make my mom angry, but not that time. They say life hits hard. 
But I hit harder. Floor by floor I was painting the walls with Enclave's blood. I bet I could become an artist. My only punch against an Enclave warrior was enough to paint a Brahmin on the wall. And then I saw the cave of the president. I knew from my dreams he had nothing to say. And who do you think you are barging into my office? Now be a good mutant and stay put. Guards! And I knew he was a phony. What kind of the leader would be so weak? So it took me half a second to turn him into a skin cape. Did I feel anything after it was done? Um, sorry, I forgot the question. I took out the rest of the bad guys, planted a bomb on the machine, reflected light with Vic's bold spot, laughed, released all prisoners and went back to the entrance. That's where we faced the apex predator, Horrigan. Fighting him felt like punching a puddle. It was dumb. It was completely brain dead of me to think I could take him down alone. I used all the skills and weapons I've been mastering since I was able to walk at age 7. We punched, poked and mocked him, but nothing worked until I penetrated his helmet by accident and shot him in the eye. He fell on his knees and his pumping drugs blew him up like a watermelon. I couldn't believe my eyes but we made it and I didn't even cry. I took a body bag to bring back home the biggest pickle I have seen. We made it to the metal fish and swam back to San Francisco. My tribe and the people of Wall 13 returned to Arroyo to celebrate and rebuild the village. Month by month we were restoring the might Arroyo once had. Soon enough it grew to a big city. My mom took the in uniting the kindest people together. Walters knew how to use the hack that helped us to get the best of our place and ground. My tribe did two important jobs as great warriors. They protected the tribe and as simple farmers, uh, people of the land, the common clay of the new west. You know, morons. They worked a field and along with Brahmins, manured it. To be completely honest, they manured everything. As a recognized war chief, I had some power and found funny activities for my friends. Sulik was so obsessed with polishing his club that I made him the grand janitor. Once he polished the city so well, he blinded some spirits up there. The barman from the wall city became an imbecile teacher. He taught imbecile, so anyone could understand me. Rumors have it that he simply served fire water to children in his classes. Everybody was fine with it because children slept like locks after classes. Vic's bold spot became our official guiding light at the darkest night for the spiritless tribals who wanted to join us. Goris got an award for the best actor. So realistically he was tearing challengers apart at the end of the trials. K9 was my most loyal friend and later a wise advisor because Thor lost his way to Arroyo and got stuck in textures. We stayed best friends though. After a few fruitful years of my mom's lead she was welcomed to the spirit world. And then I became the elder. I took charge and introduced governing through games. It was simple as that. People with the best ideas would get different prizes, like fresh water, food, money or Sulek's polishing services. For some reason, men were very happy about the last prize. It led to a game of friendship and later NCR invited us to their tribe. Although they demanded too many shiny coins to pay every month, Goris showed his acting skills on a few NCR warriors and they knocked off the prize. All I wanted was the thriving tribe, but after a few years of listening to the same ideas every day, I got bored. The games didn't amuse me anymore, I was dying without an adventure. At last, a few days ago, I made up my mind. I took K9, Sulik and Goris with me because the barman from the Wall City had always complained about his heart and later a heart attack took his life. He was welcomed by the drunk spirits though. Vic was already too old and fat, so he decided to stay in Arroyo to live a peaceful and fat life. I kissed his bald patch one last time, yet it had a strange black mole, perhaps he needed to see a doctor, and said last goodbye to my good friend. This night we are going away. Sulik packs his hammer and tons of my stuff. How else are you going to survive in the wasteland without holy toasters? I rope my aunt one last time and leave her all the gold I found on my journeys. I could never chew it anyway. Goris takes his dusty rope and K9 his favorite bone. We jump into the car. I have a plan to go east, to the Mojave Desert. I've heard there is a golden army of robot warriors like a new Reno. Maybe they would join me. <gasps> and then we'll build a statue in memory of the lizard man together. Yeah, that's the plan. Well, I have to go now, my lovely spirits up there. Thanks for guiding me all this time. My journey in Arroyo came to an end, but my new journey in the Mojave Desert will start soon. Wish me luck.